Hey listeners, Melissa here. Just a quick production note on this particular episode. My mic and computer decided to go boom, so we had to record the conversation on Zoom, I know. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, but just note that if I seem a little quiet, it's because I wanted to make sure we preserve the quality of the audio so I'm not talking as much. Uh, Enjoy this wonderful episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writing Easy, the podcast that takes the act of writing, which can sometimes be not easy, and tries to make it less not easy. I'm one of your hosts, Mary Mascari. And I'm your other host, Melissa Long. We have a guest with us today, uh, the wonderful, the brilliant, and remarkably patient and understanding Emily Leverett. Uh, thank you, Emily. Thanks. Welcome to the Writing Easy podcast. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. I I know I'm super excited to talk to you because we're going to hope you can help us with uh, learning a bit more about research, which is obviously something you do professionally in many areas, not just as a writer, but also as an academic. Yep. And boy, oh boy, because I also write historical fantasy and I worked on historical mystery and research is just a blessing and a curse. And I'm really yeah. eager to pick your brain. <laughs> Yeah, same. I I have not written anything of historical nature because I'm intimidated so much by the research process. And I love world building, but there's something about, uh, you know, needing to base it in fact and reality and history and maybe getting it wrong that just intimidates the heck out of me. And then it makes me become this, you know, eternal procrastinator. So uh-huh. I want to know your process. I want to know any tips you have for us mere mortals who are trying to do this and who don't have a PhD. Uh, I want to hear like what have your experience been and what lessons have you learned or what tips do you have for us but why don't you introduce yourself to our audience sure hi I'm Emily Leverett um, I'm a medievalist I'm an English professor I am an editor and I'm an author uh, the piece I'll be talking about today is my historical paranormal romance called The Wolf in the Cloister, part of a series called The Wolf and the Nun, that is based on the life and writings of the 12th century abbess of Shaftesbury, Marie de France. See, I'm already intimidated. I I always feel like, oh, geez, another one of those bubblegum nonsense things. Oh, fascinating. And see, I, I, I imagine you're like me where you get inspired by these that you like you find out about this person you're like wow this is so cool I'm going to write a story about them but it's also you said it's also a fantasy the paranormal romance and things like that so I guess the first thing I want to know is how do you get started you know how did you get started uh with you know, with this character how did this person inspire you yeah um well, she wrote a series of lays l a i s <laughs> that are short poems that are medieval romances, which is basically stories of knights and ladies and love and stuff like that. And hers, unlike a lot of them, do have really more fully drawn women characters. Um, Hmm. She's one of the few authors from the period that we know is a woman um, and that's not just writing religious texts. And hers are medieval fantasy. There's all sorts of magic and people get turned into all sorts of animals. And so it already is fantastic to begin with, which makes it a little easier. There are two main characters in my series, Marie, which is based on her, on the historical figure, who's a nun, and then another character, the love interest named Blaise Claveret, that's based on Bis Claveret, a story by her. Um, and it's the first uh-huh. sentient werewolf story in England. So he um, turns into a wolf three days a week. It's not a lunar cycle. It's three days a week, which can seriously cramp your style. And it cost him his first marriage um, in the story. And now, is this in your story or in her story? Both from her story. Oh, that's it's so crazy. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in part, he didn't tell his wife that this happened before they got married. Awkward. And she was just afraid he was going out cheating on her, but it turned out to be worse because he turned into a wolf. And he has to have his human clothes to turn back. So she gets a knight who is in love with her to steal his clothes so that he stays a wolf for several years. In wolf form, he befriends the king. She marries somebody else. And then he's like the king's pet for a while. She comes to court and he tries to attack her. 
And the people at court are smart enough to go, you know, that wolf hasn't ever attacked anybody. So maybe we should ask her some questions. So they torture her and find out what he is, give him his <laughs> clothes back. And he turns back into a man and sort of lives happily ever after. And she and the night she's married to go off and you know, sort of live presumably more or less happily ever after, except um, when he attacked her, he bit her nose off. And now when she has daughters and her daughters have daughters and on down the line, sometimes they're born without noses. So in terms of what happens to the wife, it's kind of a cruel story, much cooler than what happens in my story, but it is really interesting and fun to play with and an interesting sort of plot constriction when you have a character that turns into a wolf three days a week. Like, yeah. So you found this story and you went, I, I want to adapt this. I want to, I want to take this and, and, and play with it. Yeah, exactly. She's got about a dozen lays and other plot points of mine are based on some of her other stories. Okay. Um, but they, they diverge a lot because the stories are short. They're, you know, not even 2000 lines long. They're all poetry. So sure, not sure, long at all. And so you get to put in all sorts of details and things like that. And you get to spin out sort of the internal lives of the characters. And, and that's what's fun about it. One of the secrets I used, and I know most people can't do this, but you know, how do you make the time to do this is I, I just make my students read the poems in class. They're a part of the <laughs> syllabus because <laughs> so, they fit perfectly into what I'm teaching. And so we read them and talk about them. And so that was nice to be able to do that too. So it's, it's nice if you're going to write historical stuff to genuinely like the period you're writing in. Yeah. I imagine that made it easier also because thing, because I feel like whenever I'm doing research for things, I have two problems, which I think you probably would not have being in that field already. The first being either I have too much information or I have the wrong kind of information. Like, like I either can find, you know, all these things about these big public events, you know, all the things that the white men were doing. Yep. Uh, but if I want to know like, oh, wait, she's going to, she's going to, needs to get up in the middle of the night. What is, is her, like, would she have? Slippers? Does it? Were they slip? Like, what, what kind of slippers would they be? Like, would they? Okay, if she's going to the middle of the night. Does she go downstairs? Would she be upstairs, downstairs? Like, what? How? You, yeah. Nothing. Like, you can't find that stuff. And you know, and like, oh, I guess I'll make that up. And I don't feel comfortable making that up because I, I either assume that my audience, I assume that my audience knows more about the topic than I do, and will therefore come crashing down on me with violence if I get anything wrong. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, really, it's a very healthy uh, psychological place yeah. to come from. No, that's the, the reason that none of the characters I ever write have or ever write will use guns because I don't know anything about them and I don't want to learn. And gun mm -hmm. people are very firm on you getting it right. Mm -hmm. And well, definitely, which is fine, but like they're just a group of people I do not want to upset. So <laughs> I care. And well, I mean, you know, that's the nice thing about the Middle Ages. And honestly, I do have a very good editor because at one point my character sneaks out into a garden in the middle of the night and takes matches, which I learned were not invented until the 1800s. So nope, didn't take matches. It's a full moon. It was fine anyway. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's stuff that you just don't know. And I think one of the things, and I know that this happens to scholars who write fiction too, is you know so much and you want to shove all of it in, but you just yeah. can't. You, there's not enough room. People don't care you know, about all of the minutia. And so you have to sort of let it go and, and let the story go where it needs to go and do what you can. Like, that's the fiction part of it. So I find that if there's a conflict between what my story is going to happen and what history is, most of the time the story is going to win. Oh, like, okay. Cool. You know, um, there are a few major events that I'll cover. Like, I'm going to cover the death of Thomas Beckett in terms of history, there are multiple people that Marie de France can be. And so I just picked the one I liked in terms of story. So she is the bastard sister of Henry the second. And oh, because it's a it's of course it's a pen name. Like yeah. she wasn't well, writing. Oh of it, course. He does have a sister named Marie. And I mean, a she's incredibly educated. The bastard sister of the guy that would become King Henry the Second would have had that kind of education. It was not mm -hmm. uncommon 
for bastard children to go into the church. Um, for women, there could be a lot of power in the church, especially if she's an abbess, so she's like the head of a whole abbey. So mm-hmm. it's it's entirely possible that she was this person, this Marie that we know existed. Like <laughs> the problem is, is, is the Marie there, the Marie we think she is, you know? And so I was just like, well, for my story, yes, she is, because that's yeah. the most interesting. And so at one point, Thomas Beckett is killed sort of on the instruction of Henry the Second. Right. Um, That's the whole who's gonna take care of this guy for me and the and the right. guards are like I mean got it, not, boss. Not entirely like, you know, we're all gonna march down to the church and and I'm gonna be right there with you. And you know, you fight like hell. Like it's not entirely unlike that. Um but he yeah. ended up having to do <laughs> massive amounts of penance because they did brutally kill Thomas Beckett on the altar of the church. And yeah, that's not yeah, okay. it really it was bad. And like that's a historical fact I feel like I can't ignore. And Beckett yeah. is a character in my book, so if they get that far in history, that's going to have to happen. So there are some things that like I unless you're really doing alternate history and I'm not doing that just historical fantasy. You want to keep in mm-hmm. mind that some of the big things people expect need to happen. But you can play around with the details. But yeah. Yeah. Which is why you should never look to historical fiction to be a an accurate historical reference. So if you are writing something historical, don't use other historical fiction because yeah. that author has taken as many liberties as she wants. And yep. you might end up having something completely wrong. It's like, well, it was in this book. Like, doesn't matter. Yeah, I was completely stunned when I finally figured out that Shakespeare didn't actually write English history. He wrote Renaissance <laughs> propaganda. And I was like, yeah. oh, those aren't true. Okay. I mean, you know, again, they hit the big events, but their slant is very much a slant on mm-hmm. history. It's interesting because the, the medieval period in particular right now runs up against that sometimes is people make all sorts of claims about, well, that can't exist because it didn't exist at the time. And they Mm -hmm. think it didn't exist at the time because everything they've seen doesn't have it in it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems. And we see it, it's one of the things I talk about in my classes, the appropriation of the Middle Ages by the alt-right, by white nationalists who view the Middle Ages as some sort of golden age for white men, which it was not the way they think Mm -hmm. it was. And so... There is also some fighting against that. Like, well, you know, a woman wouldn't have known how to read. Yeah, yeah, no, there were women that knew how to read, right? Latin, English, French. Like, they were fluent in several languages. They were all powerful women, mostly, that came from powerful families, but they all existed. And so pushing back against that is a little, like, you kind of have to do that, too. And there are some good sources that do that. The Public Medievalist is a website, and they've got a whole series of articles on sort of what has happened with the Middle Ages and sort of what the differences between fiction are. They have stuff on the SCA. They have stuff on Game of Thrones. They have a whole series Mm -hmm. on race, a whole series on gender. And they've recently started a whole series on video games. And they're great because these are people with PhDs in the field that are talking to public audiences. So they're not writing for other scholars. And they're just really great in terms of putting a lot of stuff in context. And so if you want to write medieval historical fiction, they're a great place to start because they're not behind a paywall either. And that's nice. That's awesome. So yeah, let's, yeah, I'm well, now I'm going there and now I know what I'm doing the rest of the weekend. (laughs) Like, oh, well, sorry, kids, you don't get dinner. Mom's reading (laughs) fascinating historical facts. With that, like, I kind of want to back up a little bit because because you're you mentioning this website that there's a lot of these resources of people who you can you can talk to like you can take advantage of I mean not yeah. take advantage of but you know no totally take advantage exploit. of exploit see this always sounds bad um, but you know to finding those resources can sometimes be kind of tricky there's a there's actually a lot of medievalist stuff there's a source called open source Chaucer um, which is Chaucer specific so the later Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. Medievalist.net is another one that exists. And so you can find a lot of stuff on it. And there is scholarship on it too. Like medievalism, which is anybody writing about the Middle Ages, not in the Middle Ages, basically. So all medieval fantasy is actually Mm -hmm. a really popular 
topic um, in scholarship now. It's it's become kind of a field in itself. And mm-hmm. so there are a lot more resources. One of the major presses that does work with it is um, a press called McFarland that's actually in North Carolina. It walks that line of scholarship, but often scholarship that's meant to be accessible to a public audience as well. Yeah. And so they tend to produce books that are paperback and that are not that expensive. Um, okay. Yeah. So they're a little easier to find. Um, but also I'll say like most universities that are public universities are required to let non-university people use them, use the libraries. Like that's part of, of what they do. I know it's true in California and it's true here. And so you can go into a university library and, you know, you can't yeah, check not right out now. the books, but well, not right now, but you know, yeah. you can, you can use their databases to find things and find ways to get a hold of stuff. So it's not entirely inaccessible, but there, there are a lot that are open source and a lot of scholars unlike the academic presses are are very much interested in open source material so you can yeah. find stuff um and a lot of scholars who get very excited about this sort of stuff want to share it with people i'm writing an essay now for a collection that i think we're going to pitch to McFarland about medievalist writers medievalism ist writers people that write stuff and i'm going to write an article about my fiction and the rest of them are scholars talking about medieval fiction. And so it's, it's not as prohibitive to find the information and I will possibly get tarred and feathered by the entire of academia for saying this, but Wikipedia is not that bad. Like just for like quick and dirty facts and like, you know, who married, who, when, and when stuff happened, especially Mm -hmm. when you're looking at history, like long ago history, I wouldn't use it for current events, but you know, most of those are pretty accurate. Like they will give you a good timeline and things like that, that can be super useful. You can find out Google is your friend. Like I had to figure out how long it would take from ride to ride from one place to another on a horse and stuff like that. And so using the internet is okay for, for like, yeah, yeah, these, these facts, interpretation analysis, let's not Not go there for that, but you can find, sounds like you can find other little hubs of the internet that do have experts there who are going to be giving you that good, that good, good stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so is it possible to write a good historical novel without having going, without going into a library or you really think there should um, be a balance between the two? I think it depends on what you want to write. Like yeah. if you are super invested in exploring the political events of the time, then you need to do the research. You know, mm-hmm. if you are interested in it as a backdrop, it's less important because the broad strokes will be there. And that is one world building convenience you get is that people are not coming to a completely blank world, right? Like if you say this is set in medieval England, there's a lot of stuff that people will already know that you don't mm-hmm. have to tell them. So that's nice about it. But yeah, I mean, I'm not going to write a hardcore accurate medieval fantasy because that's not what I want to write in part because I don't want to have to be that detailed and careful and precise in my research and in what I write I'm more interested in the story and the people but I think you can you just you know have to be willing to dig around in different places and you know find things because there are a lot of good histories out there that are accurate, you know, and well-written by, again, people who are more or less scholars, they're either actually scholars or have been hobby scholars for so long that they're actually scholars that Mm -hmm. write really great accessible books about whatever time period you want to read about. There's one on the Tudors and there's one on um, the Plantagenets and I cannot remember the author right now. Um, But I mean, these are also like hefty books, like you're looking at six, 700 pages and it's, Mm -hmm. it's written, not quite like a novel, but it's much more sort of story focused, but it is also interested in being accurate. And so it gives a lot of, Mm -hmm. a lot of good information and background. And I think that's just the thing about being an author, right? Like, you know, 8 million things about your world and you get to tell people five of them. And Mm -hmm. so 
you know, that's part of it. But yeah, I think people can. I think I think you have so to really be you, willing to to love what you're doing. At what point in the process do you encourage people to step back and do more of this research? Do you do a lot of it up front before you start outlining and writing, or do you do it as you need it after you have an initial story outlined? Um, generally speaking, as I need it, because I've done a lot of background and so I sort of know the setting and stuff. And I'll I'll do research because I'll come across something and be like, I don't actually know what that is, or I don't I've spent so much time on Google Maps, so much time on Google Maps, looking at how one person would get from one place to another and the names of things and, and all sorts of stuff like that, that you just you can't do all the research first because you don't know what mm-hmm. you don't know until you try to write it. And then you're like, oh, I need to know that. Go out and find it. I and then the that, trick is how do you stop researching and get back yeah. to the work? Yeah, as you say, I think that's a problem people run into is if I just do a little more research, I'll be ready to write. Well, no, that's you're never going to get there if that's the way you're sort of thinking yeah. about it. Like I write popular fiction. And so my focus is on the story and the characters and that's what drives it and that's what the readers will appreciate and if that's mm-hmm. what you're doing then that's what your focus has to be almost no matter what genre you're in there are a couple genres hard sci-fi and military sci-fi where a really deep focus on like the technology is what the audience is looking for but most genre fiction people are reading it for the story and the characters and if they get a glimpse of the history they're super excited, but, you know, so research, writing, planning, all of it, you want to be story and character forward. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid about having to get it perfect. Right. Yeah. Perfect is the enemy of the good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Revise forever if you want to. All right. I'm going to ask one more like super practical question, Mm -hmm. like really, you know, nitty gritty. How do you, like tracking all your research, tracking all the stuff you find, keeping track of all those facts and things. And I know, like, especially as an academic, that's something that is probably more, uh, you might even be more familiar with doing. That's a skill I've never really had. Um, What's the, what are some good tools, good ways of of keeping all these nuggets in one happy place? You can Um, find them again. I really like Scrivener because Mm -hmm. it does let me import a ton of research. So I have a lot of web pages in Scrivener and stuff that I can go read um, and transferred stuff there. Um, I am a big and perpetual fan of annotated bibliographies. I find somewhere to keep a list of what you've read and a short summary of what it said and where to Ah. find it. Um, And whether that's a Word document or like old school people use note cards and just keep a stack of note cards. It's got, you know, everything on it. um, my copy editor at Falstaff Books uses EndNote, or not EndNote, um, the one with the Evernote? elephant. Evernote. Yeah, Evernote. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she does, I mean, just like when people talk about story Bibles, research is just a part of the story Bible, right? It's just, you have to write or type stuff down or you won't find it again. And that's like, I have scads of bookmarks in specific folders in my browsers and stuff like that, um, that are labeled like Marie for this set of books and you know, Millie for another set. And so that I can find the stuff that I need, but whatever you do, you have to be systematic. And I like Scrivener, but there are other things mm-hmm. out there you can use. So it sounds like the challenge is not just, not simply to find the information, but then be able to get back to it again. Yep. And knowing what it is so that you can you know, refer yeah. back to it or, or if you like, wait, what was that again? You could find it as opposed to, it's in one of these books. It's on the internet somewhere. Let me look at my browsing history. Right. And Even those together is important. Okay. Inevitably, um, something you think at the time that is not relevant will be relevant later. I have found that yeah. so often. Um, and, you know, oh, I'm never going to need this. And then suddenly I need that. And so like all of it, write all of it down, keep all of it so that you know what you've read when and that sort of stuff. That's, if you're going to do historical fiction, that's part of what you have to do is you have to pragmatically sort your research. Yep. I'm so good at organizing. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I say this, like I have it all handled, you know? Um, Yeah. Good. It's a, it's a struggle. (laughs) 
but it's fun though too. And I, like I've yeah. always, I always, those wonderful moments where you, you find a little fact or a little thing that's just like slots perfectly in to yeah. what you need. And it's, it's the best. I think it makes yeah. up for everything. Exactly. Yeah. And when you get to see a story come together around some of the stuff that you've found in the research that you've done, it really is great. It's a great feeling. Mm-hmm. Like with everything, it gets worth it. And read in the genre you're going to write in. This is the first time I've written romance. And so I did a lot of romance reading, not medieval paranormal romance and, and historical fiction, because I didn't quite want to take from that. But I read a lot of Regency. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people who are a lot of people who are good at writing sex scenes, because I had no idea how to do that. Yeah, I, I still can't do that. I don't know. So it, <laughs> I, I joked once, except it's not quite a joke. I'm a really, really good touch typist, so I can write the scenes with my eyes closed, so I don't actually have to see it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Get it. You've got way too much interesting stuff. This is the problem. <laughs> yeah, um, it is the problem. <laughs> it's so helpful. It's still, I don't know if I'm still ready, if I'm ready to dive into this world yet, but... Uh, you got to do I'm it. Still intimidated, but I'm also intrigued, right? There's so many different possibilities. There's so many stories that have gone untold and so many different time periods that, you know, like you said, we only have the white male perspective. <laughs> like we don't have heroes yeah. of other, um, other races, ethnicities, genders. And so there is something that's pulling me to try and do some of this work, but it's intimidating. Yeah. You know, yeah. And there is that out there. I mean, like white men were not the only people that wrote, like Marie wrote, but there are, um, they've been silenced for a long time, but academia is waking up to them and making those stories more accessible across the board. And there are people that have been erased, not as much by people in their own time as by scholars later who weren't interested in them. Like we Mm -hmm. shouldn't be reading the things that 18th century white men tell us are important. We should be finding the things that we think are important. And that's not easy to do, but increasingly there are people who are doing work like that and bringing things that have been lost to the forefront. That's so exciting. Cause yeah, you hear these people like, well, we didn't have black people back then. Are you kidding me? (laughs) (laughs) They just popped into existence in 1703. Yeah. I don't know. They just weren't there before. Yeah. No huge civilizations, nothing like that at all. Just absolutely not. No, no education, no amazing uh, advances. Nope. No, they yeah. just, they weren't there. Yeah. Ugh. But yeah, so it was, but that's what's so exciting about this is that this is a chance to find these things and to bring them to people. And yeah. that's what, one thing I really love about historical fantasy, historical fiction is that it, you can, it makes it come alive so nicely. And I, I yeah. really love that. Yeah. I mean, my Bis Claret in, in um, my book, Blaze, is um, a veteran of the Crusades. And mm-hmm. the, person that was his mentor was what he would call a Saracen, what we would call a Middle Eastern, but that's what they mm-hmm. called him at the time. Um, and he is much less enthusiastic about the Crusades having been on them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so yeah, you can talk about these people that did exist. And it was a much more diverse place than people think. And race was a thing and was not a thing. Um, the creation of race happens throughout the Middle Ages and up through the Renaissance. The way we think about race now and struggle against the way we think about race now, it was not like that in the Middle Ages. Um, it was still, a lot of it was still religion. Like, I don't mm-hmm. care what color you are so long as you worship the same God I do, right? Like, you're not Jewish, you're not Muslim, you're fine. Um, and that didn't have to do eventually it starts to get broken down into race but at first it's less so and so we essentially see some of the building blocks of you know yay modern day racism in the middle ages it's but amazing yeah and and so it is fascinating there's a great article that ends with the line that basically says that the end of the middle ages and the end of the medieval romances was the creation of the white christian male like that's what came out of it was this identity and that it wasn't a solid identity before then. Um, which, you know, 
I think a lot of people think that white Christian male has just been an identity that has existed coherently forever. And it's not. Christian mm-hmm. is not, let alone all the other things. Yeah. Right. So, you know. Yeah, you are you are far too fascinating and you really have to cut this out. Um, yeah. <laughs> because we could seriously talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but um, we'll run out of podcasts. Uh, so I think we, I, as much as it pains me to say, I think we have to wrap up here. Yeah. Um, where can, where can people find your stuff? I am blessed in the world in that I have a very findable name. If you type mm-hmm. in Emily Leverett, you will find me. <laughs> You'll find my webpage, which is emilylavinleverett.com or emilyleverett.com. They both go to the same place. Um, my books are all on Amazon. Um, my publisher is a small press called Falstaff Books in Charlotte, and it's primarily sci-fi fantasy horror fiction. So if you like that, it's a great press to check out for a bunch of other things as well as my stuff. Wonderful. I can't tell you how, how happy I are. This has been just a wonderful conversation. And thank you, Emily, yeah. for joining. I am so excited you were able to share some of your wisdom w- with the podcast group. Emily and I have been friends for many, many years, and it makes me feel really old when I think about yeah. how long I've been. <laughs> Um, yeah she's a fantastic writer and editor and she's smart as you can tell so um thank thank you (laughs) that's wonderful so much for having me oh our absolute pleasure and come back anytime uh so we, we always wrap up our podcast so we'll do this now just by saying remember everyone that writing is hard so take it easy i'm mary and i'm melissa bye everybody bye